Well, welcome again and happy Mother's Day to all of the moms that are here uh, today that are present with us in the room, or maybe we've got some that are watching uh, online. It's a joy to gather here today uh, on a day that's dedicated to um, honoring uh, the incredible women who uh, shape our lives, um, nurture uh, our souls, uh, em- embody love uh, in its purest form, and uh, always act as a personal assistant, apparently. I once heard a pastor say this, mothers are the hands by which we take hold of heaven. And uh, I think there's some real truth um, to that phrase. And, and so whether you're a mother, you're a, a grandmother, Uh, Maybe you're an aunt or simply someone who uh, has exhibited and poured out um, motherly love, uh, kind of in that role. Um, Today's your day, and we honor you, and so happy Mother's Day uh, to you all. And uh, just to be sure, there is a drawing at the end of the service, and so I just don't want anyone to feel slighted. And and so if you didn't get a raffle ticket, um, now would be a great time. Uh, to maybe go and get one of those uh, if you're a mom, because it's like a spa day package, and so you're going to want that. And I just, I don't want anyone to leave and go, I didn't get a ticket. So I'm just, I, you can just get up and go get one right now, maybe. Or I don't know, Toby, Toby's standing up. I see women moving. This is good. I'm so glad I did this. I would have been in so much trouble after the service. Oh, man. Yeah, Toby, you can help him. He's right back here. Just come right back here to the sound booth, and Toby will get you. Yes. Oh, man, I really, I would have been in big time trouble. This is great. Oh, man. Okay, so while that's happening uh, back there in the back of the room, and and they're handling that, and they're coming back to their seats, we're continuing our journey through Genesis this morning. So if you've got your Bible or the Genesis Journal... Uh, You can turn with me to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. Ooh, there's some thunder and lightning. We needed needed some rain. I mean, I know we've had a lot of rain, but we need it. So, Um, yeah. I've yet to be in this building while it's raining. Um, Since we have a metal roof, does it make a lot of noise? I'm just trying to prepare myself. Okay, well, we heard the thunder, that's right, so if it starts hailing, I bet we'll hear it. Uh, Genesis 28, um, and while you're turning there, one of the more common metaphors, and one that we're going to look at today, but one of the more common metaphors we use in life is that of a ladder. Um, When you and I think about ladders metaphorically, um, they really are always about going up or down, but most of the times up, right, because we think about... um, uh, making progress. That, that's kind of what that metaphor of a ladder is about. Like we're wanting to go up, but we don't want to come down the ladder. We want to go up the ladder. We want to make progress. We want to achieve more. We want tomorrow uh, to be better than today. And so when we use this metaphor of a ladder, uh, we say things like, you know, I want to climb the corporate ladder. I want a better job. Um, I want more authority and responsibility, or I want a, a higher wage or more salary. I don't, I don't want to be brought down uh, the ladder. Uh, I want more. And so we use this ladder in, in the sense of our jobs or, or from a corporate standpoint. Uh, we also have the health ladder that we're trying to climb, right? We want our health Uh, tomorrow or in the future to be better than today. And so we say things like, well, I'm I'm trying to eat better. Uh, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to work out more. Um, I wear a a watch here. This is a, some of you have Apple watches. I have a little Fitbit, man. This watch tracks everything. I mean, it tracks the calories I'm burning in a day, how many steps uh, I'm taking. Uh, It even has a microphone and monitors my sleep. Uh, at night and can tell me when Wendy has snored uh, the night before. Seriously, sometimes I wake up and I go, there's no way I was snoring that much. You have to have, like, be part of this. Um, But (laughs) anyway, love you, honey. Happy Mother's Day. Um, Yeah, I'm uh, in, now I'm in trouble with her. And so, 
Anyway, but, but, you know, we're always trying to get better uh, from a healthy perspective, you know, or we're trying to climb that health ladder, corporate ladder, and we also have the spiritual ladder um, that we're trying to climb, right? And so we say things like, you know what, I know that I need to spend more time in God's Word. I know that I need to pray more. I need to give more. I need to go um, on more mission trips, um, and that's why um, when we think about the spirituality as a ladder, uh, as we climb to God, if we think about it in that context, it's why like, guys like Jacob uh, in the Bible are so baffling to us. If you were here last week, um, we were introduced to this guy named Jacob, and Jacob um, is Isaac's son, Abraham's grandson. And God had promised Abraham, the grandfather, he'd prom- promised him land, descendants, and blessing unilaterally, unconditionally, eternally. And so that promise was going to get passed down through the generations uh, forever and ever. And so it goes from Abraham uh, to Isaac, and then from Isaac to Jacob. And and there's nothing about Jacob that makes you think that this should be God's pick for this. I mean, nothing. If you remember from last week, Jacob was the second born of twin boys. He has an older brother named Esau. Remember, we said he was hairy like an orangutan. And, and so this means, since Jacob was born second, that he shouldn't have received the family birthright, but we saw that Esau gave that away, and uh, Jacob took his blessing. Jacob was also a guy who hated the outdoors, and almost everybody in this day and time in this culture was outdoors back then, like all the time, but, but not this guy. He just wanted to stay inside and hang out with mom. By the time he's 40, instead of uh, initiating, instead of, you know, leading out, he's doing whatever his mom told him to do. Like, this is not really the guy that you would think would be God's pick. Plus, um, he committed all kinds of sin. He was a deceiver. I mean, he deceived his brother. He deceived his dad. And so you just, again, you got this guy that doesn't seem to be the right pick, and God says, no, 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 this is the guy that I'm going to use. And so today we pick up the story in Genesis 28, and at this point in the narrative, Jacob's mom's told him that he needs to leave. He's just deceived his, his brother Esau. He's stolen his blessing, and mom has caught wind of this, and she's like, you need to get out of here and go visit um, Uncle Laban's house, her brother. You need to go to your Uncle Laban's house and visit him and let things cool down because your older brother Esau wants to kill you. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story, Genesis 28, beginning in verse 10. It says this, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. Okay, let's pause. What what do we remember about this guy, right? What does he hate? Being outside. And, And we don't know this. I mean, it's possible he was traveling with some assistants or, or some other people, but, but the story doesn't tell this, and, and he's got to go from where he's been there in Beersheba all the way to Uncle Laban's house, which is roughly 500 miles, which is about the distance from Longview to Birmingham, Alabama, and, and he's going by himself, and, and so you know that this is going to take a long time. For him to get there, and he's outside, and apparently he has forgotten his travel pillow. How, how many of you have a travel pillow? Come on, be honest. Yeah, you got to have one. Yeah, and Wendy has a dedicated travel pillow, not one that she sleeps with every night, just one we take with us on vacation. This guy's forgotten his travel pillow. Wasn't very prepared. You know why? Because he's not an outside guy. He gets ready to fall asleep. He finds a rock, and he makes a pillow out of a rock, so things aren't going well for him. But he falls asleep, and he has a dream. Let's take a look at the dream. Verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder. And let me just pause right here and say, um, the word that's used here in the original language is, is really something more substantial than a ladder. Uh, We've heard it our whole lives as the word ladder or this context of Jacob's uh, dream or Jacob's ladder, but this is really more substantial than this. So I want you to picture not just like a 20-foot ladder leaning up against a house or up into the heavens, but more like a staircase, 
okay? It's a little bit, it's, it's more substantial. It's more like a stairway or more like a staircase. So he sees this ladder set up on the earth or this staircase set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Okay. So Jacob has a dream, and he sees a ladder. He sees a staircase. He sees a stairway going up to heaven with angels uh, going up and down the staircase. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially, Um, Most theologians believe these angels are there, and what they're doing is they're carrying out God's work. And so they're bringing the blessings uh, of God and God's will down to the people, down to humanity, and in return, they're taking the prayers of the people back to God. Whatever the case, I don't really know what's going on here, but whatever the case, it's just a good reminder to us that there's a supernatural spiritual realm that's going on around us that we don't always see. Not only are angels present, but God's also there in this dream. And in this dream, the first thing that God does, he speaks to Jacob in his dream, and he, he reiterates the covenant that he'd given Jacob's grandpa, Abraham. I mean, he basically reminds him here, like, you got land, descendants, and blessing, and it's going to, you know, everything's going to flow through uh, your family, and through your family, the rest of the world's going to be blessed. It's just a reminder of the covenant. And then he says this, God does, because of this, I'm, I'm going to make three promises with you. He says, I'll be with you and keep you. Um, I'll bring you back to this land, um, because you need to find a wife, and, and I won't leave you until I've fulfilled my promise to you. And so then Jacob responds to this dream. Look at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head, his travel pillow, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. I think we'd all agree Bethel's a better name than Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I've set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a full, a full tenth to you. Okay. A few things that are happening here. I just, I want to stop and point out a little bit. Um, God's made this unconditional promise to him, right? No strings attached here. God not one time to Abraham or to Isaac or to Jacob has said, these are the things that I'm promising you, and here's what you must do in return. So so these are just, it's an unconditional promise. Like, you're the heir of the covenant that's been passed from your grandfather to your father, now to you. But what does Jacob do here? He takes it, and he, he flips it, and he adds conditions to it. And he doesn't add conditions to himself because that's not what we do, right? He adds conditions to God. He says, God, if you'll be with me, which God had already said that he would be, and he's like, "Uh, if you'll watch over me, which God had said, I will watch over you, I'm already going to do that. Then he's like, okay, well, God, if you'll provide me food and clothes and um, help me, maybe give me safety in my passage back as I journey to my father's land, and then you can be my God, and then this this most bizarre thing, I'll let you live in this rock. (laughs) 
This can be your house, this little rock that I'm going to set up as a pillar, and I'll give you 10% of everything that I have. So to be clear, God didn't ask for any of those things. God didn't ask for a rock to live in. He didn't ask for 10%. But this is what Jacob does. He adds these conditions, and this is what you and I do, right? We have this tendency when God makes promises to us to take it and to to flip it and add conditions to it and say, God, okay, I, I know you promised me this thing, but if you'll do this thing or when you do this thing, then you'll get my loyalty, and at that point, I'll believe in you. Here's what we do when we do that. We're doing what Jacob did. We're trying to conditionalize our relationship with God. And then in chapter 29, Jacob makes it from that place where he's spent the night and had this dream. He makes it all the way to the land of his father. And if you were with us back in the fall, this scene should sound very familiar to you. Okay, You um, might remember from our study in the fall that Abraham went to this very place, right? Um, he, well, actually, he sent a servant Uh, to go find a wife for his son, Isaac, which is Jacob's dad. And so this whole scene has played itself out in a very similar fashion. We're back in the same land, probably at the same well, uh, where his granddad's servant had found his mom. So he's at this well, he meets these shepherds. This is what's unfolding here. Uh, I'm not going to read it all to you. Um, These shepherds inform him that they're family. So, So Again, Jacob makes it all the way to the land of his father where his uncle Laban lives. He encounters some shepherds, starts engaging them in dialogue. The shepherds are like, awesome, we're family. You and I, we're connected. You've come to the right place. And we start to get a little bit of the picture of Jacob's character here because he says, you know what you guys ought to do? You should give your sheep something to drink. Again, remember, what do we know about this guy? He's the great endorsman, and he's trying to tell these professional shepherds what they ought to do. Here's what you guys ought to do. You should water your flock. And they're like, this, I just find this scene funny. Uh, they're like, um, listen, we don't water the flock until the whole flock is here because there's this big stone on top of the well, and we only want to move it one time. And so just chill out, buddy. We're going to wait till everybody else gets here, and then we'll give all the sheep a drink, okay? That's what's going on in the scene. They're like, we don't want to do this twice. So Genesis 29, verse 9. While he's still speaking to them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. Now, again, if you remember the first time this story played out uh, with Abraham's servant, when Abraham's servant got there, he was going to, uh, to find a wife for his master's son. And when he gets there, he figured out who these people were. Okay, this is family. They all went back to Laban's house. They uh, you know, wanted to have this big feast. They have this big feast, and they wanted to party and eat and drink with him. And then the servant said, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, we got to take care of business first. Like, we got to settle uh, this deal, this engagement. And so once they settled the engagement, um, thing the next morning. He, he kind of gets things, the servant gets things moving along, like, like let's get going, we got to get back. Okay, Jacob's not like that. And, and I'm guessing Jacob's not really in much of a hurry to return back to his brother that wants to kill him, right? And so he's like, hey, I think I'm just going to hang out here at Uncle Laban's house for a while. Um, we can make some assumptions here, we, you know, we're, as we're about to find out. He's, he's already seen a really pretty girl, He's, you know, making eyes. He's like, this is a much better place for me to be right now than heading back home. And I think Uncle Laban knows why he's here, because there's a reason why he'd come back to the land. So Uncle Laban begins to initiate a deeper relationship with Jacob. Let's look. Verse 14. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. 
And then he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? So we just get this picture that he's just been hanging out, helping the family just for free. And, and so Laban's like, hey, I, I, mean, I don't want to take advantage of you, uh, which is ironic. Uh, tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Verse 17, Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Okay, let's just pause. There's an odd little detail here. So um, it's describing these two women, and it says one of them, Leah, her eyes were weak eyes. She had weak eyes, okay? Here's what it means. It means something wasn't quite right about her eyes. We, we don't know what it is. We don't know if she was blind. We don't know if she's cross-eyed or, you, you know, but there's some, something physically is going on here. It could be that there's no life in her eyes. Just something's going on with her eyes. And then to add insult to injury, bless her because her name means wild cow. I know. That's what I thought. I think the Bible is using some language here to just let us know, really in a kind way, in a polite way, that she was not an attractive young lady. But Rachel, her sister, however, it says, was beautiful in form and appearance. Again, just a, a polite way of saying she's attractive. And so Jacob looks at these two daughters. He sees one that has weak eyes, and he sees one who's attractive. Verse 18, so Jacob loved Rachel the attractive one, right? And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. That's so romantic. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So seven years is up. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. He slept with her. So this has always been a little interesting to me. Um, for seven years, Jacob's been waiting for this moment. He's like, this is the woman that I want to marry. I've got this promise that's been made to me. I'm going to work these seven years. It has been like a day. I have gladly served these seven years to get to my wedding night. I just got to tell you, I don't think he's going to mistake these two women. I think over seven years, he knows the difference between these two women. And so we're left to just ponder what's going on here. Like, he just wouldn't mix these two up. And so, again, I'm just, you know, it's just posturing here. I'm just guessing, but it's likely, since they had a wedding feast that night, that he's probably had a little too much to drink. And so, dad brings um, the other one in, thinking I'm going to fool him, right? Because, again, I just think if he's sober and under normal circumstances, he's not making this mistake. But that's just me kind of reading into the text there, okay? Verse 25, and in the morning, he realizes, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Did I, um, did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the weak of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. So it's like, hey, uh, we'll fix this pretty quickly. In one more week, you can take the other wife, but then you got to stay another seven years. You're going to owe me another seven. And so Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. And so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. And so he literally has um, two sister wives. And it's just a crazy story, right? Okay, now did you catch the big switcheroo that's going on here? 
the big switcheroo was not the Leah Rachel one. There's a bigger one that's going on here. Jacob, the deceiver, has now been deceived. Jacob, whose parents sinned against him, I believe, showed favoritism, right, is now committing that same sin of favoritism toward his new wives. Listen, here is the deal with sin. Sin is like that icy, snowy cul-de-sac that you just can't get out of. Like you just drive around and around and around with your tires just spinning out and you can't get out of the cul-de-sac. I've seen marriages where one in the couple uh, commits adultery. Um, and and I, I don't want to call it an affair. I want to call it what it is. It's, it's adultery. And, and, um, and, and so you, you commit adultery, and then this other person goes out and retaliates, and they commit adultery uh, so that the other spouse will know what it feels like. Um, or this person runs out, gets a divorce, because even though reconciliation in marriage is always our goal, Scripture makes room for when there's adultery and makes that um, grounds for divorce. And so this person gets divorced, and then the first thing that they do is they go out and they hop in the sack with somebody, somebody else that they're not married to, and they don't even think about the fact that what they're doing now is committing the same sin that their spouse has committed that caused the end of their marriage in the first place. Like sin is just this icy, snowy cul-de-sac, and we spin our wheels, we spin our wheels, and we just get caught in the cycle of sin. And the sins that we commit against others oftentimes get committed right back to us. And so we see this again and again in Jacob's family. I mean, it is like the Old Testament version of keeping up with the Kardashians. And so we have Jacob, who's married to Rachel, the wife that he really loves, and Leah, the wife that he was tricked into marrying, and he says this, verse 31, or the scripture says this. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, which, by the way, means son. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon, which means God has heard. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attracted to me because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name is Levi, and Levi means attached to. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which means praise. And then she ceased bearing. And at this point, um, God sees this, and he closes her womb, and it doesn't say why. I think perhaps it's because she's starting to get a little bit prideful, maybe a little bit arrogant, right? She's like, well, I got four kids. My sister, Rachel, she's got none, right? And so at this point, uh, Rachel gets a little upset, and in the next chapter, chapter 30, it just unfolds like a soap opera. So let me just summarize it for you, okay? Rachel, the beautiful sister, says to Jacob, "Um, why aren't you giving me any boys? And he's like, honey, we've been trying. This is not my fault. Uh, This is a God issue, right? This is God's fault. And so she does what others have done before because sin is a snowy cul-de-sac. It's this cycle. And so she gives her servant, her maid, Bilhah, to Jacob and says, go sleep with her and I will claim her children as my own. Again, sound familiar? So she has a child through Bilhah, names him Dan, which means judged. She says, God's judged me by not allowing me to have kids. She has, uh, Bilhah gives birth to Naphtali, which means wrestled. She's like, because I've been wrestling with my sister Leah. And then Leah's like, man, Rachel's catching up to me in the kid department. I better have some more. 
So I'm going to give Jacob my servant Zilpah. So Zilpah has Gad. Gad means good fortune. Then Zilpah has another son named Asher. Asher means happy. And so there's this race. Leah's got six boys. Rachel's got two. And at this point in the story, it just gets crazier. Leah and Rachel start fighting over mandrakes. It's like these root vegetables. They're kind of like parsnips. It was a food that was known um, for its ability to increase fertility. And so Leah's son, Reuben, is out in the field harvesting these mandrakes. He finds some mandrakes, and Rachel is like, uh, I'll tell you what, since we're sister wives, you can sleep with our husband tonight if you give me some of the mandrakes that your son found. And she's really desperate to have a child, and so she thinks maybe these mandrakes will help. Then two more sons are born to Leah, Issachar, which means for hire, and Zebulun, which means honor. So that's eight in all, six of her own, and two that were from her servant Zilpah. And then finally look at verse 22. After all of this, it says, finally, God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, which means may he add. Joseph saying, may the Lord add to me another son. This is a messed up family. And it is the cast for us for the rest of our study for Genesis. So let's just roll back the tape to the beginning of the story, okay? Jacob is on the way uh, to go and meet these people, his eventual wives. He's going to his uncle Laban's house uh, to start this crazy family. He's got this dream about this ladder, about this stairway to heaven. And God says, I'm going to give you land, um, descendants, and, and blessing again, unilaterally, unconditionally, eternally. And then God uses the deception by Jacob and toward Jacob, um, the favoritism by Jacob and toward Jacob, this crazy soap opera to begin to fulfill his promises through Jacob. Now, honestly, when you imagine the type of person that God keeps promises with, is it? this guy. I mean, when we think of this ladder, it seems like he's going down the ladder, does it not? seems like he is headed in the complete wrong direction. This can't be the guy. There is no way he qualifies. He is just a mess. His family is a mess. And friend, that's the point. The beauty of our relationship with God is that it's not contingent on our behavior. God loves using messed up people. God loves using messed up people to accomplish his purposes. It's all throughout scripture. We're just beginning to see it. He uses people like Jacob, he uses people like you, he uses people like me. God uses messed up people. In fact, in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus is out selecting his disciples and he's picking out messed up people. His disciples were a mess. And once he selects all of these disciples, one of the first things that Jesus says to them is this. I want you to see this. This is John chapter 1. Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what Jacob didn't know, because he couldn't have possibly known, that when he's having that dream of that stairway, he sees Jesus. And it's not about our effort. It's not about climbing up to God. It's about the fact that God would eventually send Jesus as the staircase to make his way down to us. 
Jacob thought that the staircase was a gate to heaven, that, that it was access to God. And he would be right in the sense because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so I just want you to see the moral of the story for those of us who climb Jacob's ladder, meaning for those of us who place our faith in Jesus, we are guaranteed that by placing our faith in him, that our eternity, that our eternal tomorrow will be better than today. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a second? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, who is the ladder, who is the staircase, who is the stairway to you. He's our gateway to heaven, and we are grateful um, that you love using uh, messed up, imperfect people. And, and we pray. Um, that as a bunch of imperfect people with imperfect families and an imperfect church, that as we try to reach out to other imperfect people for you, that we would remember that this is not about us, but it's about you and your glory and Jesus alone. And so we thank you for Jesus who saves and we're humbled that you would choose to save us. That you would choose to send a ladder, a staircase, a, a, an avenue to make it to you. Father, if we'll just bow our knee, confess our sin, and believe. And so I pray for those that are in the room today who've maybe yet to take that step, that today would be that day that you would admit your sin, that you would confess that to God and that you would believe. And then for the rest of us, God, who are trying so hard to clean up our lives, God, for sure we want our lives to be transformed. We want to be more like you. But God, you love us. You love us for us. And so help us to realize that. It doesn't matter, as one pastor I, I um, once heard say, that it doesn't matter how many little, little old ladies we help across the street. God, we, it's not about our works, but about your love for us. And so may we Feel that, sense that, and receive it in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, thank you so much for being here uh, today. We do want to have our Mother's Day drawing before um, we close out the service. And so, Toby, come on up here. Okay, will you bring me that? I, I don't want to be the one to do it. Make somebody else do it. Ask Chuck to do it. No, ask Chuck. Chuck, you do it. I want to blame somebody else. I don't want to have anything that's special. Did you take a ticket? Okay, good. Thank you. Then I could have. So uh, while Chuck's drawing that, we got just a little uh, spa basket for you, uh, some candles, some scrub. I think it's things ladies like. I'm not really sure. I don't use any of the stuff that's in this basket. Uh, but maybe perhaps what's most important, and there's a gift certificate in here to Tula Wellness, so you can go get a massage or something like that. And so we're going to present this to you. Also, be sure on your way out, if you didn't stop by the candy bar, uh, to stop by the candy bar and get you some candy on the way out. Uh, since my wife and daughter put that together, I get to take home everything that's left. So if you don't deplete it, I'm going to, yeah, happy Mother's Day to me. I'm going to have a bunch of M&Ms and Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. Uh, I don't have my glasses. Toby, can you read this for me? Oh, uh, yeah. Nice cop out. Uh, 449-2816. And where? Ow! Come on! Patty Coleman.
Here's your left. Congratulations. Oh, now everyone's going to leave sad and depressed that didn't win. Oh, man. Hey, it's been a great day in God's house. Amen? Amen. Kristen, Kristen, our communications director who answers the phone every week, you should probably just start singing to people when they call into the church office. You did a great job today. Thank you for that. Um, uh, on a serious note, if you're here today and you'd like to pray with somebody, uh, even though it's a Mother's Day, you might have come in here uh, today with some wounds and some pains and some hurt, some struggles, uh, some things that you just want to share and get some prayer about. We'll have some people uh, that are part of our prayer team that will be down here at the end of the service to receive you. Maybe you just want to ask them what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, they'll be able to lead you in that discussion as well. There'd be no greater joy. Uh, for us today uh, than to lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you would understand his saving grace. And so as we stand and we read our benediction together, if our prayer team would come forward, we'll read these verses from Jude out loud together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You're dismissed.